Yeah, I really like the the woody plants. I think it's really the backbone and the really the structure of a good landscape. And there are lots and lots and lots of benefits to it. Uh, not only do you get the the fall color, you get the, some of the best looking flowers um, anywhere. And pollinators are, are actually way more attracted to woody plant flowers than they are even like perennial flowers. So um, woody plants really are uh, kind of the backbone of any good landscape. And the other reason I really like the uh, woody plants is this: uh, you put enough uh, you put enough woody plants in, and you got uh, all kinds of things. You get these eventually. So and this to me is uh, kind of worth it right there. So. Uh, with the, with that said, let's uh, go on and we'll talk and talk about some specific plants. So I want to get this uh, kind of out of the way up front. I'm going to be talking uh, pretty general about a lot of plants out there. Uh, there are a lot of plants that I will say, uh, here's the plant, and it might come in tall, narrow, it might come in broad spreading, it might come in, in, in a ground color. Um, and rather than get into a lot of the specifics about the cultivars, I'm just going to cover the tree. And if it's something you're interested in, I would encourage you to go do a little Google, Google research, go uh, go surf the internet, find, see if you can find a plant uh, that you like in maybe a form that you like a little bit better. Um, I found that uh, in kind of the early days uh, when I was putting this uh, presentation together, I got bogged down pretty quickly uh, with different cultivars and I'd get on one plant for you know 10 slides. And so I thought instead of one plant for 10 slides, I would just, do 10 different plants in that in that same time period and let you guys know that just if you like something go ahead and uh, search for some of the uh, the cool cultivars that are out there so i'm not going to be covering a lot of cultivars uh, there are exceptions and the and those exceptions are going to be i cover the cultivar and not really the main plants uh, because either it's just the one i really want to focus on or it's so different from the main plant that uh, that we do it that way so uh, so as we go if you like something write it down go look and see what's out there uh, you'll often find a narrow version or a, uh, a weeping version of something or something with different different uh, colored flowers or maybe a different size of plant uh, no matter which of these uh, you end up liking so uh, so with that said we're going to start with this one this one uh, just got through blooming uh, here in the valley recently uh, but if you're going to if you if you were to pin me down and just ask me what the perfect tree is for a homeowner landscape, it's going to be this one. It is going to be a crab apple. Crab apples are small-ish. Uh, they, they will fit in most um, homeowners' uh, uh, landscapes. They have flower colors that you can just pick and choose whatever flower, flower color you want. Uh, the apples uh, stay on the branches these days on, on the newer cultivars. Uh, over the winter and have to be pushed off the next year, uh, but generally by then, mostly they've been eaten by birds. Uh, this is something for sure that you want to put, you know, in a, in a window so you can watch during the winter time as the birds will constantly visit this sort of thing. But crab apples are among the most versatile, prettiest plants uh, that you can find out there, and it is just a tough, tough little tree. Um, but you can see uh, different flower colors. This one is really, really cool. This is a sergeant. The, Crab apple down here. You can see you've got these uh, red buds uh, that actually open up to these white flowers. So crab apples just come in a variety of, uh, of different sizes, shapes, colors, and they're they're just so versatile. But really, one of the best right, one of the best plants out there. Uh, great looking spring color, uh, a smallish tree that almost every landscape can, can handle. Uh, the fall color is absolutely stunning. And when they develop the fruit, even the fruit is really attractive and comes in different colors. So you really have your your choice. Uh, uh, to pick and choose. You can kind of see what's going on with the fall color on these. So crab apples are just uh, one of the one of the best little trees out there. Uh, and you see this is this is what you get in the fall color. So uh, as this 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 is really one of the one of the best trees you can get. Uh, Eastern redbud. Uh, this is a tree that it would have just gotten done blooming uh, as you walk around now. Uh, this is a, generally speaking a smaller tree. This is going to be a bit of an understory, and I mean it kind of likes to be on the north end of a building or under some different trees. Uh, it kind of likes the shade just a little bit. So uh, the, this one comes in a, a, also a variety of forms. This one is actually something we have right out here at the uh, entrance to the Conservation Guard Park. Uh, it is this uh, purple colored uh, one with the leafy, uh, with the, the purple leaves with the uh, the weeping form on it. Uh, and the, the flowers on this thing look look almost like it's been wrapped in Christmas tree lights uh, when it's blooming. So pretty, pretty spectacular, spectacular little tree. Uh, one thing I would like to put about the, about about this one, I should have put the picture up. Uh, in the summertime, almost all these leaves will have a little notch taken out of the holes, 
uh, out of this out of the uh, out of the lease. Uh, leaf cutter bees really uh, are attracted to that plant. Uh, this is service berry, probably not uh, one that a lot of people are familiar with, but uh, you absolutely should be. Um, it's right there on my list of uh, favorite woody plants. Uh, brilliant, bright white flowers in the spring. It's one of the earliest things to bloom. Uh, it, it's going to bloom you know, either in early April, kind of that late March. It blooms really early. Uh, and the, the, the reason for that, of course, is uh, it develops this fruit down here. The fruit is ed edible uh, you can, if you can beat the birds to them, uh, but you will be in competition for the birds to eat all of those uh, fruit off there. Uh, and those fruit will ripen at a time when not a lot of other things are ripe. So this isn't a fall fruiting plant. Uh, this is actually going to ripen in sometime in the late spring. So really the first couple weeks of June or so is when this plant is actually going to have ripe berries on it. Uh, right about the time a lot of birds have, uh, you know, have babies to feed and, and they really go crazy over this. Uh, so but uh, definitely have one of these and eat the berries if you can fight the birds for it. But you can see, despite those, uh, yeah, to go along with those beautiful, beautiful flowers in the spring, uh, you see that the fall color on these are pretty spectacular. This kind of this orange, very intense orange and red colors. So really one of the, uh, one of, one of the great trees in the landscape. Uh, this is an elderberry. Uh, this is a, uh, there's a lot of varieties of this, comes in some black foliage variety, comes in columnar and, and some, you know, cut leaf or, or lace leaf uh, varieties. It even does develop uh, this fruit that uh, I, uh, I hear you can eat, I hear it's slightly toxic, but I hear they're edible uh, if you uh, take care of them. Uh, but it does also come in kind of this, kind of this yellow or gold colored foliage. Uh, but uh, I've seen, I've seen this plant used a little bit as a replacement for people who can't grow like a, um, a Japanese maple because it has somewhat similar looking leaves. This is wisteria. Uh, this thing would be in bloom around the valley now, like right now. Um, wisteria is a vine, uh, but it is a very large vine. Uh, you can see the structure we have ours growing on isn't insignificant. Uh, it's a couple of feet and made of concrete and the, uh, the wood beams are quite large. Uh, so this is this needs a rather large structure uh, to be able to climb on. I've also seen these uh, pruned into tree forms, but uh, wisteria flowers are one of the most like kind of iconic classic uh, uh, floral scents uh, out there in in, in nature. Uh, just such a pretty plant, but the uh, the scent that that comes off of this plant uh, when you're sitting under this pergola that we have is pretty amazing. When this flower is in bloom. Uh, and when it's not in bloom, uh, these seed pods develop and they make a really cool, very interesting, like, uh, uh, almost like decoration, almost like wind chimes hanging from the inside of that thing. Uh, it's, it's just, it is such an attractive, uh, such an attractive plant. Uh, but again, you do need a, a pretty significant structure to grow that on. Uh, in the fall, you can, uh, you can see here where they actually uh, uh, get this yellow color on there. So it's, uh, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty good looking plant. Uh, this is a chocolate vine. Uh, chocolate vine, we have a couple of them um, out here at the garden, is, uh, is great. It actually grows fairly well in the shade uh, and it, it grows out in the full sun. So you're going to get a bigger plant, a uh, much more aggressive plant, uh, something that really does, gets a lot more uh, size on it out in the sun. But they do grow reasonably well in the shade. We've got a couple here that are in uh, kind of deep shade uh, and they grow really well for us there. Um, you can see I've got a couple of different flower colors uh, on these. Uh, I think. The, this is so. This here is why it's called a chocolate vine, is because that flower is kind of that chocolatey color, uh, and this one is a uh, a different one that comes in the kind of this off white color. Uh, this is a contorted filbert. Now uh, this is this is a tree that it's funny when I was making this presentation, I realized I didn't have a really great picture of it uh, or recent one uh, of it in the summertime when it's just leafed out and it's green and just kind of its usual look for the year. Um, it's just, it is such an interesting looking plant uh, in the, uh, in this, in the winter time that that's usually when I photograph it. You can see, I just, we usually see it up here and we photograph it up there. Um, but in the winter time, this thing really shines when it's got no leaves on it. Uh, these twisty gnarled branches uh, make an incredibly interesting uh, winter, you know, a winter look out there on the winter landscape. Uh, this is the, uh, this is the catkins it gets in the, in the springtime. Uh, and it does come in a, uh, a variety with uh, some newer uh, burgundy foliage. Uh, and in fact, uh, we took a picture of one in this same shrub uh, a couple weeks uh, ago where uh, this had actually uh, 
tied itself into a pretzel, like a, like an absolute perfect pretzel shape. Uh, this is a desert willow. This is a Utah native plant. Um, when I say Utah native, I, I mean southern Utah. I mean the deserts of southern Utah. So you'd find this uh, in St. George. Uh, but it does grow up here in the Salt Lake Valley reasonably well. Um, it does get a little dieback at time and time. So we have to go through sometimes and just uh, cut the top foot of it every year before, it, uh, before the following year. But you get rewarded with this plant. You get a kind of a... Uh, uh, a small, uh, somewhat smallish tree uh, or big shrub. These actually, these aren't, these aren't really big, you know, 15, 20 feet tall. Uh, Multi-stemmed, uh, very uh, almost exotic looking uh, leaves that grow on it. But the, uh, the flowers that pop out on this thing in, in midsummer and basically will, will kind of remain on the plant and it'll produce uh, um, a lot uh, over the course of the summer. Um, look almost like orchids. They're these uh, long tubes that hang down. And this uh, this bird attract, this thing attracts hummingbirds really like crazy. So it's really kind of a tropical looking uh, a flower, but the hummingbirds, you can't, you couldn't sit in front of this tree more than about 10 minutes before the hummingbirds would all uh, show up. Now this is a plant that most of you have never seen. And if you have seen it, you've likely seen the one in this picture. Uh, so the, the uh, out here at Conservation Garden Park, we do have one of these, but not a lot of places do. Uh, Thanksgiving Point, I believe, has a few, but they actually grew it from the seed right off this plant. Uh, so this is a little unusual plant. You have to hunt around the internet to find this one, uh, but it's completely worth doing. So this is a large shrub, more than a small tree, although the, the difference uh, isn't, isn't really much there by those two definitions. Um, so this is gonna be you know, 15 foot tall or so, 10 feet or even 15 foot wide. It's almost, almost as wide as it is tall. Uh, somewhat slow growing uh, plant that is super hardy, super tough. And when it is in bloom, every square inch of that plant is absolutely covered in these uh, white flowers with the uh, kind of the uh, red throats on them. Uh, it's got a, a fine pinnate, almost a, a, a tropical looking, almost a, um, uh, like a palm tree looking leaf on them uh, throughout the year. And then in the fall, these flowers have developed this kind of fruit on them down here. And this is not it looks a little like an orange, but it doesn't feel like an orange. It's actually a really hard seed pod that pops out these, uh, these seeds that look a little like chestnuts. Uh, I hear if you uh, roast them up, they, they taste really good. Uh, but this is, this is really a cool plant. A little hard to find, but definitely worth uh, uh, seeking out. Uh, this is, so this is one of those cultivars that I talked about that I would probably make it mainly focus on the cultivar. And this is Jacobson's Mugo Pine. So we have quite a few mugo pines around, uh, around the garden. Um, this one is very unique and, and it doesn't have a lot in common with the other ones. This is a very, very small plant. Uh, it's been in the garden since probably 2008 and it is maybe 10 inches tall, maybe a foot. It's just not very tall. Uh, this thing is gonna be like a bonsai in, in your landscape. Uh, it's really a, a neat plant, but really unique to have something uh, that hardy and that tiny uh, as an evergreen uh, out in the garden. And like I said, you could actually just like treat it like you have a bonsai, even though you don't have to uh, take care of it like one. <coughs> uh, this is Aronia. This is uh, the black chokeberry. Uh, this is one of those uh, uh, amazing, you know, uh, all season looks good in all season plants. Uh, so this is the flower it develops in the, in the, uh, the springtime and the, it'll usually become absolutely covered uh, with uh, the flowers. Uh, this is the fall color down here you get. Uh, so you get this amazingly uh, beautiful, like striking orange red flower color. <laughs> uh, as the name would suggest, it does form this little black berry on it. The black berry is not uh, great to eat, but I hear, oh, sorry. But I hear if you were to make jam out of it, uh, I hear people make some jam out of it and it actually tastes really good. Um, my theory is if you threw in enough sugar, anything tastes pretty good, so, uh, but, uh, the birds do kind of a, a flock to this thing during the uh, the fall when these berries are are going. So this is a, a, another good way to attract uh, some wild wildlife to your to your landscape. Uh, this is bluebeard. Uh, you might hear it called uh, Bloomus spirea in some places. Uh, this is uh, something I call Caryopteris. I don't really call it by the bluebeard name. We just call it Caryopteris around here. Um, this is a midsummer bloomer. It comes on it comes on in midsummer and then will bloom continuously. Uh, through the rest of the year. But these blue flowers attract 
bees and, and pollinators like crazy throughout the whole time you have this plant up. Uh, there, no, at no time can I walk past most of these caryophytes and not find uh, bees going down. I know not everybody loves the bees, but I, can, I love anything that will attract pollinators. I mean, you can see up here, we do have, there. there's one of these that come in a uh, kind of this yellow form and the flowers are still blue. So the, the yellow and blue, blue make uh, quite the combination. But uh, this is really good if you want to attract uh, bees to your yard. Uh, this is a uh, smoke tree. Uh, you can see why it's called a smoke tree. These flowers, these are the flowers of this plant. They come out and they look an awful lot like uh, like smoke coming off this plant. Uh, this this uh, the new foliage coming off of uh, smoke trees is uh, bright burgundy, very dark in color. Um, except obviously this one where you've got the yellow foliage uh, and the uh, the flowers are even kind of a little yellowish uh, on those ones. Uh, but they come in various sizes. This this is kind of cool. This is um. Uh, <coughs> Uh, kind of a big shrub, more than a uh, more than an actual uh, small tree. So it's usually a multi-trunk form plant, but uh, it definitely has a place uh, in the landscape with that dark, dark foliage and this uh, kind of smoky colored uh, flowers on it. This is a Korean fir. Uh, and we don't have the species here, but we do have this little one. This one is called Icebreaker. Uh, it's a pretty unique looking dwarf conifer. Um, I you know, I'm I'm actually a real sucker for dwarf conifers. I like uh, I like uh, the uh, the evergreens uh, in in the landscape. I think people uh, need to use them a lot more uh, to create that uh, that look through the winter, especially through the winter when uh, everything else has dropped its leaves, turned to color and dropped leaves. Uh, these these conifers uh, add that uh, that sense of continu you know continuity to the yard as it goes into the winter. They also like little little evergreens also add like shelter for birds and, and structure and texture to your, your landscape, even in the winter time, uh, as well as during the summer. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a good way to have kind of something similar uh, throughout the year and then going into winter. Uh, this is another little, uh, one of my lo another little favorite uh, dwarf evergreens. This is uh, Karsten's winter gold uh, muco pine. Uh, this is a small dwarf evergreen, two feet or so by two feet wide. Uh, and you, you can see during the winter time, it does this. The leaves turn these bright yellow during the winter, and then it greens out as the uh, the summer moves on. But uh, this is a really cool plant to have uh, in your landscape. Add that texture and add that uh, that constant uh, evergreen. Uh, but then it goes that bright gold in the winter time and really shines in your winter landscape. Uh, this is pearl bush. Uh, if you've been out to Conservation Garden Park recently, you've seen this uh, blooming along the uh, east uh, uh, side of the garden. Uh, the reason it's called pearl bush, obviously, is these little buds look like pearls, look like a little string of pearls before they open up. And then, of course, they open up into this and the uh, the shrub is absolutely covered in them. Uh, it's a really uh, a, a spectacular plant uh, to have in your landscape. And it's blooming uh, in the valley now. Uh, it's blooming here at the garden now as well. Rose of Sharon. Uh, this is a, a pretty tropical looking plant because it's a, a, the hibiscus flowers. Uh, but this is a, uh, a shrub that is completely hardy to, to here. Um, once established, this plant doesn't need a, a lot of water at all. Uh, it's a good perimeter planting because it can get, a lot of the, especially older cultivars can, be, can get quite tall. Um, but there are, are many different varieties uh, available in this particular plant. Many different colors of flowers, many different types of flowers, double blooming. Uh, but again, this is this is a real tropical looking plant because it really does add uh, a real hibiscus flower to your landscape here in the desert. That's uh, what uh, ours look like during the summertime before they start blooming. And this is kind of winter look at them. They actually retain these little uh, uh, flower pods uh, throughout the winter time. But you can see it comes in pretty much any color you want these things to come in. So very, very, uh, very tropical looking, nice, nice plant. So this is, Ken okay, it says Kentucky coffee tree. This is not a Kentucky coffee tree. I'm not sure what happened here. Um, this is actually a yellow horn. Uh, so this is quadrastis rather than a uh, gymnoclast. Uh, I, I, sorry, I was just mentioning. This is a yellow Natalie. wood. Sorry, I said yellow horn. This is a yellow wood. Yes. But I was just mentioning to Natalie earlier, like, I, one of these is going to be really wrong, and I'm going to find it right in the middle of the presentation. So here it is. This is the wrong one. Um, yeah, this is not a Kentucky coffee tree, and this is a yellow wood tree. Uh, this is a, a member of the pea family. Uh, it's a bigger tree. Uh, the one we have out here has probably been there since 
2006 or 2004 and is already quite large. Uh, so this this is a really big tree with a uh, uh, some really big uh, uh, leaves on it, but it does develop this really gorgeous uh, hanging, uh, uh, nicely scented uh, flowers in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the springtime. So. Uh, this this uh, this is another evergreen. This is a bigger evergreen, but it's not gigantic evergreen by any means. Uh, I would say this thing is is in that 15 to 20 foot tall range after about 15 or so years here in the garden. Uh, but you can see the shape uh, that this takes on over here. Uh, this is the shape that it is. I don't the, we don't prune this to uh, this shape at all. This is just kind of how it grows. So this is a, a, a kind of a ball shaped uh, evergreen plant. Uh, this is what the uh, the bark looks like. So you have uh, some good looking bark on this one. Uh, the cones have a kind of this interesting way of popping up all along uh, uh, these stems uh, near the top when the uh, when the cones go on. So pretty uh, pretty unique looking evergreen. Uh, real uh, you know real specimen uh, for uh, you know kind of a centerpiece. Uh, this is weeping Norway spruce. Uh, this is so I'm just going to say this is what ours looks like uh, here at the garden. Uh, you could see 10 of these weeping Norway spruces and they would all look different. Uh, and they, in fact, they might not even look a lot alike. Uh, so it's a pretty unique plant. You see ours has kind of grown into a little, uh, almost like a little dinosaur uh, thing. So, uh, but yeah, it, they're all going to be a little different. They all take on a pretty unique shape, but they're all kind of crazy and twisty and they all have these weeping branches. Uh, and so they're, they're really, really interesting. But they also develop these uh, very large, you know, six, seven inch long uh, cones on them that make them uh, all the more interesting. So, um, yeah, there's another one of those where uh, it seemed to get biased. This is a paper bark maple. Um, uh, the paper bark maple is, uh, it's got some interesting aspects to it. It's got these really deeply lobed leaves that you see down here. So it is a maple leaf. It's just like they're deeply cut all the way to the uh, petiole. Uh, it's got a nice flower in the spring, although it's really not very visible. But this tree really shines when you look at the bark. Uh, it looks like there might be something wrong with that bark, but there isn't. Uh, that's just the way this tree this tree operates. It uh, has this nice peely bark. You know, it looks like paper. That's the name, paper bark maple. Uh, but this is a uh, uh, this one has kind of a yellowish fall color. But this is kind of a smaller tree overall. This isn't going to get uh, you know this isn't going to get as big as like the big Norway maples. This is going to be in that 25, 20, you know, 20, 25 foot range. Uh, and I've seen some of the best looking ones I've seen of this plant um, do get a little shade from the heat of the sun. Uh, this is one of the bigger trees uh, in this presentation. Uh, this, this I've seen mature bur oaks being, you know, six, seven feet around at the trunk and being, you know, almost 100 feet tall. They can get very, very large. They probably won't get that large, although you do need kind of a big yard to uh, to have this one. Um, it really uh, grows well here. It is it, it is kind of a, a great option, uh, but this is actually a good uh, option for like somebody water with secondary water. I see somebody ask about secondary water. Uh, we, I don't I don't always know about the secondary water uh, nature of a lot of these plants, but this one we kind of do know. It's kind of renowned for it. Uh, but a, a classic oak, uh, very big, very burly. Uh, it gets its name uh, for all these little uh, burrs on the uh, acorn here. The acorn is, is you know, 75 or 80 percent covered from the top uh, with this kind of a lacy leaf um, uh, cap on it. So with the bur oak, I wouldn't recommend it unless you have a, a big piece of property or your uh, house is at a city park or something. Uh, but really a, a great large tree for the state of Utah. This is barberry. Uh, this is a shrub. Comes in, like I said, uh, uh, lots of form, lots of colors, but most of the time they're a version of red or, or burgundy. Uh, these are very thorny, they, 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 uh, but the thorns kind of uh, uh, are somewhat useful. The deer don't like to eat them, for instance, unless they get really hungry. They don't tend to eat thorny plants. Uh, birds tend to like to hide in barberries because uh, those tangled thorns, birds have a tendency to feel safe uh, when they're inside uh, little brambly, uh, thorny things like this. Uh, and when they are in bloom, the, 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 the blooms are really tiny on it, uh, but when you look up close, they're actually really uh, quite pretty. They're really grown more for the foliage, uh, but something definitely not grown for the foliage and definitely grown for the uh, 
uh, for the uh, uh, flowers are magnolias. Uh, this one I'm going to cover is this this specific one is rosemary. Um, I like magnolias. They're really uh, they're really nice. They're really attractive tree. Not all magnolias do well here. However, a a few do, but they all have one uh, problem in common, in that they tend to bloom too early. Um, they the about the time these uh, flowers are coming out, we usually are still in the range where we get frosts and freezes and things like that. And we end up you end up getting the a lot of frosts and freezes and chunks taken out of the flower. So the reason I'm covering this uh, particular cultivar, this magnolia, is the fact that it doesn't do that. It actually blooms two or three weeks later than most magnolias and uh, avoids most of the problems with the uh, the freezing uh, of its uh, of its flower. So these end up looking great for us for uh, a couple weeks just without uh, freezing. And the uh, this is kind of a smallish tr magnolia tree overall, small tree overall. However, the uh, uh, the magnolia flowers on this, the buds and the blooms on the canal are are quite large, especially for the size of the little tree. Uh, another uh, uh, Utah native, though this this is our pinion pine. Uh, this is the uh, this is where uh, mostly you get pine nuts from. So if you ever eaten pine nuts, uh, it's the pinion pine that most of the time around here they come off of. Uh, so it's a Utah native tree. It grows well here in our alkaline soils and dry and dry and dry uh, climate. Uh, just a solid just a solid tree uh, that uh, once established doesn't need any really extra attention because it is native to the area and will attract things like jays or squirrels or other things to your yard because uh, they do like to eat those nuts. And again, the uh, the pine nuts are roastable and edible and they're, uh, if you've ever eaten pine nuts before, this is probably the tree it came off of. Uh, so hydrangeas don't generally do well here in Utah. In fact, most don't. However, this type does. Uh, this is the hydrangea paniculata. Uh, this one is called limelight. We have this one out there. There's other hydrangea paniculatas. So if you're going to go looking for a hydrangea here in the valley, do look for one called paniculata. Uh, it's the one that will uh, uh, serve you long term here. Uh, but this one is uh, blooms uh, uh, midsummer like this, and it's got these uh, kind of these uh, lime green uh, flowers on it. Uh, really, uh, really pretty shrub. But uh, if you're going to grow, like I said, if you're going to grow a hydrangea here in the Salt Lake Valley. Uh, do look for the paniculata. Limelight uh, is one of the ones you'll find in that uh, in that grouping. Uh, so this is another one where I'm just going to cover the uh, the cultivar of it. But this is called Hetz Midget Arborvitae. Um, Arborvitaes do grow well here in the valley. <clears throat> they do have a little tendency to uh, collapse and split uh, when the snow is on them, uh, but not this one. This is a little. I don't prune these, by the way. This is just what it looks like. Uh, this is a little ball of green of uh, that will be there. Uh, year round, uh, I've seen this thing develop a little bit of uh, cone, cones on it that I've seen the birds eating. So, uh, just a solid bit of green for your uh, for your landscape. And again, it's just basically the shape of a bowling ball. It's about two feet high, two feet around. It's uh, pretty uh, interesting, uh, especially if you have a, a bit of a formal area. Um, this one looks like we've forgotten to put the name on it. Uh, uh, this one is a golden currant. So this is again, this is another Utah native plant. Uh, it's it looks this is what it looks like in the winter, so it looks kind of brambly. You can kind of see what it looks like. But when it's in bloom, uh, those bright golden flowers uh, are really are really cool on it. But the scent coming off this plant, you can smell from 100 feet away. Uh, the scent is just gets uh, uh, really really powerful. Uh, and then of course here in the fall, you get this uh, a nice kind of red orange color. Uh, through here again, kind of a kind of a brambly thing. It's it's something you maybe want with a little background, uh, but when it does develop the fruit in late summer, those uh, those fruits are are delicious. Uh, not only do the birds eat them, but uh, we all will eat them here. Uh, this is so this is Austrian pine. Uh, this is probably the most common pine tree in the Salt Lake Valley. Uh, if you drive around and you see a large pine tree. It uh, like on all odds are it's an Austrian, uh, so just just really uh, really uh, uh, common for here, uh, but it's common for a reason because uh, it's it's really stable, really sturdy, and it grows really well here once once established. Barely needs any water, uh, but the uh, the Austrians that we've started to grow here at the garden are like this one and this one. They are very very columnar. Uh, this one is called Arnold's Sentinel, uh, and this one is called uh, I think Green Tower. Uh, but yeah, this this is this is a small columnar one. That's a larger col columnar one. 
but you can find Austrian pines in all shapes and, and sizes. Uh, basically, if you have a need for an evergreen in your yard, you'll find a, an Austrian that, that can fit that need. Uh, this is one that probably not a lot of people have seen. Uh, this is silver butterfly bush. A lot of people have seen the other butterfly bushes. Uh, it looks a little different than this one. Uh, this one is a slightly different, uh, slightly different version. Blooms a lot earlier. In fact, it's about to bloom pretty soon here, where the normal butterfly bushes would uh, be blooming uh, more like midsummer. Uh, but this, like, this, this has a strong scent of nectar coming off of it, uh, and will attract, uh, as its name implies, tons of butterflies to this thing. Uh, when this thing is in full bloom, you just walk past it, and they, they. Uh, the butterflies and stuff will rise up like a little cloud. Uh, viburnums, uh, I've seen, uh, you know, three inch thick books on all the different viburnums in the world. So uh, I'm just going to cover a few right here. Uh, but there are lots of different types of viburnums. Uh, this one is called Korean spice. Uh, it's got a very strong scent. Uh, most viburnums, you know, have a really pretty fall color. Uh, and then a lot of them uh, after it were developed this kind of a, a red or something, you know, black berry on it as it goes uh, that the birds kind of tend to uh, tend to flock to. So uh, viburnums, uh, there's a viburnum for anybody who wants, uh, you know, a, a really, you know, true, you know, three seasons of of, a, of attractive plant. Uh, this one, uh, if you were to come out to the to the conservation garden park right now, is in bloom, and this is caria. Caria isn't so much a shrub, almost like it's almost like dogwood. It kind of comes up from the ground and grows these these uh, stalks on it. So it does move around the landscape a little bit because it does uh, send out some runners. Um, uh, the only thing we do on this is we kind of uh, cut out the dead every spring uh, so that the uh, fresh green uh, stems can uh, look better. Uh, but this time of year, and it's in bloom right now if you want to come look at it, uh, is it gets these cheery, bright yellow flowers on it. Uh, and it will, and just the length of it uh, starts doing this, and it will do this for two or three weeks. Uh, it's only about uh, three or four feet high, you know, on the shrub. But uh, this is this is a great background plant most of the year. Uh, it forms kind of this green wall, but this time of year it becomes this yellow, uh, uh, just a joy. And in the winter time, you kind of see these green stems. It's a little like dogwood. Uh, this is another uh, fairly large tree uh, that you would need a. Uh, a big yard to have this thing in, uh, but this is, uh, you notice there's not a lot of very large trees you know, on these things, and uh, honestly, most of the real large trees in the world don't do well here in the uh, kind of the dry climate of Utah, uh, but this one does. This is a black walnut, and it will, it does develop a walnut on there. I, I, uh, I've never actually seen the um, squirrels go for this particular walnut, although we did pull the walnut off and try to eat it one year and like it wasn't it wasn't great i think the ones we eat are um, uh, come off the american walnut tree uh but uh, uh this is a this is a very large tree um very good shade tree uh with, with these large kind of pinnate leaves uh, kind of compound leaves um turns a bright yellow in the fall but uh, uh if you wanted just a large tree to dominate a yard create a lot of shade uh, this would do it uh so this is sycamore maple uh so it's not it's a maple that not a lot of people have but you, th this one uh, is a cultivar called Eskimo Sunset. Uh, and sycamore maple is cool. It's, this, so this is the one you see with the little spotted leaves here. Uh, but most sycamore maples uh, do something like this. So when the, the new foliage is, is emerging and uh, uh, the leaves are coming out and the flowers coming out, it forms this little red thing over here uh, that ends up uh, uh, looking almost like a flower in, a, in and of itself. Uh, so it's pretty attractive. Um, Sycamore maples are kind of smallish, you know, uh, at least in terms of how, uh, how big maples get. Uh, but this uh, this Eskimo sunset that we have here uh, is a small shade. Uh, it's a small understory tree, needs lots of shade, uh, but it really does have these really unique looking uh, speckled leaves on it. It's pretty uh, pretty cool little plant. Uh, this is a Utah native. Uh, this is Apache plume. Uh, Apache plume is a pretty interesting looking shrub. You can see it right here. Um, it is kind of a crazy looking uh, uh, shrub and can get uh, a little, um, kind of a little uh, uh, messy at times. Um, every couple of years, if it's getting too big for its area, we'll actually just cut it to the ground, let it regrow from, from uh, the base up, and it doesn't seem to harm it much at all. Uh, does form these flowers in midsummer, but uh, you can see the little uh, fluffy flowers you know, kind of over here. Uh, but it does take on these seed heads. These seed heads are almost as attractive as the flower itself. 
uh, and they become really uh, photogenic. You can see here, uh, you know, pretty pretty cool looking uh, seed head. So the seed head actually like is is, is really everybody as cool as that flower is. But really, um, it's a native one. Doesn't really need any water beyond uh, uh, beyond uh, what the nature provides once that thing gets established. Uh, butterfly bush. Uh, this is one that kind of is problematic in some states where it gets wet. It tends to uh, get loose. Uh, more and more of the ones coming on the market today are sterile and can't really reproduce. Um, but this has a strong nectar scent. If you were to reach in and just, just uh, take a good whiff of it. But like its name suggests, it does attract butterflies. And it attracts butterflies like crazy. Um, this is a, uh, uh, can be uh, six or seven feet tall as a shrub. Uh, but what we tend to do every year is cut it down to about uh, three feet tall and let it regrow. Uh, it actually just looks better and, and flowers better for us. So it's actually also a very low maintenance shrub. Uh, and you see some of the other looks on butterfly bush. Uh, this is one that, that is uh, yellow. Little, the flowers are a little different. This one over here, uh, this one we planted uh, last year and grew from pretty small to that towards the end of the year in, in really just a few months. Uh, this one is called Wisteria Lane because these flowers look like wisterias on it. But wow, what a spectacular little uh, small butterfly bush this thing was last, last year for us. Uh, looking forward to that one coming back again this year. Uh, this is a plant that, that uh, I don't think a lot of people um, have have had in their yard. This is a Nanking cherry. Uh, this is a smallish, you know, seven, eight foot uh, shrub, multi-stem. I've actually seen it here in the garden, much, much smaller than that. Um, but it does have these these yellow cherry blossoms on it early spring. And when I say early spring, I mean uh, sometimes late February, early March. It is it is one of the it is basically the earliest thing uh, woody plant to uh, to start blooming out there in the garden. Uh, so it really gets the that gets the uh, the place off to a good start. And these little cherries, and yes, these are cherries. They're they're kind of small and they're kind of tart, uh, but they are they are delicious. Uh, I've eaten them right off the the tree before if I can get to them again before the birds do. Uh, but the birds really enjoy these things, and as evidenced by the fact that this is a plant that we see pop up all over the garden kind of randomly um, after some bird planted it uh, in some random spot. Uh, this is a mock orange. There's quite a few different types of mock oranges. Uh, the one you see here uh, with this yellow foliage is, is called Arium. Uh, but they all have these really pretty white flowers on them. You can see how many flowers uh, this plant gets on it. Uh, it's this yellow fall color you see right here. Uh, and so, uh, but the other thing about the mock orange is the scent coming off these flowers is incredibly strong. Uh, this is one of those champion scents in the garden that you get within 10 or 15 feet of it, it, it just, it hits you and you, and, and you're like, you know, where's that coming from? But uh, mock orange has just a very strong scent. And you see really attractive uh, the rest of the year too. Uh, this is a Daphne. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure how big this plant gets. I've seen it in some areas where it's getting a lot more water uh, than what we give it out here uh, at the garden park. Um, so I think, I think it's got the potential to get quite large. Uh, but out here where we don't water as much, it stays, you know, a little bit smaller. Uh, but this is another one with an extremely strong uh, scent on it. Uh, this is also an evergreen, a broadleaf evergreen. So this, uh, these evergreen leaves with this little uh, variegated uh, white full or the yellow, you know, margins on this uh, plant uh, kind of sticks around year round in the landscape. Uh, it's, it's uh, uh, in the winter landscape, I get something like this, uh, these broadleaf evergreens. Do attract a lot of insects uh, that overwinter on them, which in turn attracts birds, you know, to eat the insects, and a lot of uh, birds to hang out uh, to escape, you know, the winter winds or the snow or the rain. Uh, and then, of course, you get this uh, beautiful flowers and uh, just amazing scent uh, in the spring. Uh, this is nine bark. Uh, nine bark. There's a uh, there's Utah native nine bark. Uh, these all grow like they're kind of like they are native here. Uh, when I when I say there's lots of cultivars or something like this is this is probably the uh, one of the more uh, probably has more cultivars than I than, than most plants do. Uh, lots of different foliage colors, lots of different flower color, uh, uh, mostly foliage colors. I mean the flowers kind of are the same, but yeah, most of different lots of different sizes, uh, lots of different sizes. They get these things are really small or, or really large. They have a lot of different leaf colors, uh, ranging from kind of this, this reddish to to 
dark red, almost black to this yellow and these oranges. Uh, so there, there is a lot, lots of different uh, nine barks. But you see, this is generally the form on them right here, uh, tall and, and uh, kind of all these arcing branches. They do develop a flower. This is it down here. Uh, but uh, really, you're growing them mostly for the uh, mostly for that uh, uh, really incredible foliage on them. Uh, this is a uh, Zelkova. Uh, we've got some uh, really attractive Zelkovas out here. Uh, so Zelkovas grow in what we call a vase shape. And so one of the reasons I wanted to show you this one uh, in winter form with the leaves is this is the vase shape. You can see it's kind of just kind of a shape like a vase. Uh, and you see you see uh, these plants look like this. Uh, this is a, uh, I think, uh, Zelkova serrata. So serrata is a single species within the Zelkova genus, which uh, means, for the plant, means almost no insects or pathogens bother it. So it's one of those plants that uh, very, very little uh, bothers this plant once it, once it gets going. Um, it comes in very, very large, so you can get tons of shade out of these, or it comes in some fairly small uh, versions for, uh, 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 for the homeowner landscape. Uh, lilacs, everybody uh, everybody more or less knows lilacs. Uh, it can be a very large shrub, although some are quite a bit smaller. It can come in a wide variety of colors uh, and is one of the champion smells, obviously. When the lilac is blooming, you can smell it uh, uh, from quite a ways off. Uh, it's also one of the more drought resistant shrubs that we have here in the valley. Uh, I think everybody has seen the house that got abandoned, the landscape didn't get watered, everything died, except of course that 10 foot tall uh, uh, lilac that is still blooming in the yard. So uh, this, is a, this is a lilac, but a little bit different form of a lilac. This is a tree lilac. Uh, it's a little bit uh, of a kind of a medium sized to small uh, tree, but it does develop lilac flowers. Uh, these lilac flowers look like lilac flowers and even have a, uh, a good scent like lilacs have on them. Uh, but really, it's a, it's a decent uh, uh, tree, especially you know, like if you're trying to grow a smaller tree, like in a park strip or something. Uh, this is a, like I said, this is a, a smallish to, to medium sized tree, good fall color. Uh, and these lilacs tend to develop uh, a few weeks after uh, the regular lilac shrub will bloom. So uh, you end up getting, uh, you know, uh, lilac scent and, and lilac flowers, um, you know, uh, for several weeks because this thing does it kind of extend that bloom on it. Gamble oak. Uh, I think everybody knows this 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 plant. Uh, if you're up in the mountains, everybody calls this one scrub oak. Uh, so this is a one of the one of the uh, obviously dominant uh, plants in our foothills. Uh, not much to say about this. It is a you know it's a medium it's a medium sized tree overall uh, or shrub. Uh, grows these acorns, attracts a lot of local birds to it. So a lot of the local jays will show up and, and collect these acorns on it. Um, has a uh, kind of a kind of a yellowish fall color, but the fall color really isn't uh, all that nice. But it it grows here naturally and really doesn't need uh, any water once this thing gets uh, once this thing gets established. Uh, this is a different type of oak, and I wanted to make sure it covered it just a little differently. Uh, this is a, a columnar English oak. Um, it, it it can be very tall. Um, I've seen several of these that are you know 80 to 100 feet tall, but they're still only about 10 feet wide. Uh, so this is a pretty narrow tree. Uh, if you've got some uh, a space, you don't mind the height on it. Uh, they develop a they develop a uh, an acorn with a small cap and a kind of a really big acorn um, on it. Uh, uh, being, and they've got this kind of this yellowish brown fall color, but really uh, very tall, very narrow uh, for that plant. Uh, this is bald cypress. Um, this is actually a cool plant. Uh, it is a conifer, uh, like uh, most evergreens are conifers, but this one isn't actually evergreen. Uh, you see every year uh, these uh, leaves turn like pumpkin orange and then fall off. Then every, every year I get somebody going, hey, something, something's wrong with your pine tree. Uh, it's not a pine tree, not an evergreen. Uh, this is what the cones look like on, the, on this particular plant. Uh, this is one that uh, uh, is classically grown near water or even uh, in swamps uh, where it develops those kind of those knees that come up out of the water. Uh, but they do grow here uh, on, on kind of a light, uh, water that we give them here. Uh, and it's really just kind of a fascinating plant because it is a conifer that, that the leaves fall off of. Uh, this is, a, this is a, one of the cooler evergreens I think I have, we have in the garden. Uh, this is Arizona cypress. Uh, this one is called blue ice. Uh, so it's got these bright blue leaves, a fairly fast growing uh, plant. The one we have out there has only been in the ground for six or seven years and is already you know, 13, 15, 13 to 15 feet tall. 
uh, the leaves, uh, the you know, kind of the leaves and the needles of this kind of this bright blue cast. And when we looked through the other day, we were looking for some cones because we were actually we weren't actually sure what the cones on this plant looked like. And you see, they look a little like the last plant we looked at, that bald cypress. Uh, but we had these clusters growing up and down the trunk, uh, which was pretty actually pretty interesting looking uh, on the inside of this plant. Uh, roses. Uh, there's a lot of different roses. They're really good for the landscape. Uh, I think I would pass on the uh, on the traditional like hybrid tea roses, they take they tend to take a little more water and a little more uh, effort. But there are lots of roses out there, um, knockout roses or the Rugosa roses or the Grandifloras, uh, to name a few, uh, that really do well uh, here uh, in the landscapes and even on lesser water. Uh, this one up here is a uh, is a wild rose. It's the Austrian copper rose. Uh, so it's the one that blooms for a couple weeks and then goes away, but is uh, pretty neat. And these uh, little hips down here. Uh, crab apples are actually in the rose family, and so these are actually uh, something like crab apples. Uh, and the birds do uh, do eat them. And uh, you can see it comes in lots and lots of different uh, roses. Lavender. Uh, lavender is a plant I think most people are familiar with, uh, but lavender is great. Lavender comes in uh, several different colors. You can see we've got a white lavender over here. Um, it's really hardy. I saw one the other day that had yellow leaf margins that was uh, that was pretty attractive. Uh, but lavender, you know, obviously, is an herb. Uh, you can cut these flowers off in the, as soon as they uh, uh, getting close to the done, done blooming. Uh, hang them somewhere and uh, have their scent or use them in, in other things that, uh, as uh, you use them just as herbs and things as it goes later. Uh, but uh, Super, super hardy, very low water once uh, once you get these things established. Uh, this is seven sunflower. Uh, this is a unique plant. You can see kind of what it looks like down here, um, uh, kind of during the year, which just kind of leafed out. But this is actually the one of the latest blooming plants in the garden. Uh, this thing doesn't bloom until probably early fall, uh, which is really unusual for a woody plant. And so you've got a you've got something out there blooming. Uh, it, you know, in the in the in the late fall, and it attracts uh, pollinators and bees just in droves. Uh, they they end up just sort of like in a, hanging out in a cloud over this thing. Uh, it is it is really a neat plant. And then these uh, white flowers just kind of fade to this to this color uh, as the winter sets in. So really a pretty an interesting pretty interesting little uh, little plant. Um, again, it won't bloom until till the the early parts of fall. Uh, this is a this is a plant we have out here. Um, I've seen this one become like uh, aggressive in, in other states where it rains a little more than it does here. But this is a uh, this is a mimosa. Oh, I missed the common name here. Sorry about that. Um, this is a mimosa tree, uh, and the, the really the cool thing about it is these kind of paintbrush looking uh, flowers that it gets in the summertime. Uh, but if you stand in front of this mimosa for more than just a few minutes, the hummingbirds will visit this. Uh, it just and just there'll be a kind of a steady stream of them. So uh, what a cool plant. And you can see the leaves here are very, very tropical looking. So this is actually a kind of a cool way to add a, like a tropical foliage uh, to your landscape. Uh, this is horse chestnut. Uh, horse chestnut kind of has, has a, uh, a unique leaf. Uh, we call this leaf structure palmate because it looks like the palm of a hand with the leaves coming out of its fingers. Uh, this particular one <clears throat> that I have in the photo is got yellow flowers. Uh, a lot of them have either white or red flowers. Um, on them. Uh, they can be a very large tree and it's kind of its uh, normal red form, uh, where this yellow one uh, is kind of a, a shorter tree that might be better suited for landscape. So, uh, but uh, you can look around for uh, for lots of different sizes of horse chestnut. But they do develop a fairly big, uh, sometimes called a conker on them that uh, that falls out, that falls off of this thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty, uh, pretty big chestnut seed that falls off of it. Okay, uh, that went by kind of fast, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, let's find out if we had any questions develop uh, kind of as we went. So. Yes, we had quite a few questions. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so one of the questions was, oh, before I get onto that, Okay. Um, thanks for the class, Mike. And if uh -huh. there are any other questions, please put them in the Q and A box. Um, so, so, we will... uh, I, 
in, in, uh, in response to your thanks uh, for the presentation, uh, thank you. Natalie helped me out quite a bit on this presentation. So, um, Okay, so the first question we're going to start with is where to buy some of these things. Oh, um, okay, so good question. Uh, there's a couple approaches you can take. You can develop a list of plants or uh, like the trees that you really like, and then hit up the no local nurseries. Like I, like anytime you can shop at local nurseries, I, I think you're gonna get a better selection and the plants are gonna be a little bit better there than say shopping at one of the uh, the big box hardware stores. Um, and so get a list and then see what they have in stock. Uh, so, they might not have the tree you want in stock. And so that makes getting something locally sometimes a little tricky, uh, but there's a couple of, appro uh, of approaches. If you know the specific tree, the specific cultivar like that you want, I would say go looking online and there's some really good online sources. Uh, not to plug uh, this place you know, uh, too hard, but Monrovia, for instance, uh, if you find a tree at their site that you like and you want that specific tree, but nobody really locally seems to carry it, if you order it from Monrovia, they'll ask you where you want it to go and they'll actually deliver it to the local nursery uh, so you can pick it up that way. So there are some ways to get it, but if like, you know, go looking online if you want a specific plant um, or develop a list to go to local nurseries and see which one of your list that they actually have. Awesome, thank you, Mike. Um, and if they don't have the specific one you're looking for, they might have something that is similar that would fit the same need. Right, or they might have a new cultivar of that plant that you would uh, like, might like even more, so. Yeah, um, we had a question about Apache plume and if the seeds are viable and if they become kind of weedy. So I've actually never seen the Apache plume plant itself around. Um, I could see the, I could see where it might, but, I, you know, I've, you know, here in the garden for the last 10 years, I can't say I've ever really found a volunteer Apache plume plant. Not to say it won't happen, but I don't, I really don't think it's, uh, you'd consider it very aggressive at all. And so, no, I wouldn't say it gets weedy. Uh, the plant itself gets a little messy, but like I say, when that happens, I just wait till the next spring, cut it to the ground, and uh, that helps for several years. Okay. We have a question about what zone most of these are. Um, there's someone watching who is in Wyoming and they're a zone four. Mm. Um, what I would say, it, it depends on the plant, um, but if you go to our website, conservationgardenpark.org, um, and there's a tab at the top that says find plants, all of these plants are on there and it will include the zone information on that. Yeah, that's kind of uh, yeah. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, is the Japanese maple a good selection for our local landscape? Uh, they sell them locally at places like Costco and things, and right. someone's wanting more information on those. So there's a short and a, and a long answer to that question. The short answer is no. The short answer is no. The long answer is they can be, but you really need to be very careful about site selection with the Japanese maple. Uh, they, they can actually be fine, but what you need to do is you need to be able to protect them from the sun. Uh, light morning sun would be fine, but after, much after that, you want them to, to not be in the direct sunlight. Um, you wanna be able to protect them from the wind. Uh, they seem to desiccate out fairly easily. Um, uh, so yeah, they're 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 really kind of fussy. Uh, they do they do work if you can cite them right uh, in, in a spot, but they uh, they do take a little bit of a uh, of moving around to to find a spot that they like. They they be kind of fussy. Um, they seem to want a little more water than we give them out here. We've actually tried them a few times out here. Uh, we haven't really either hit the right spot or found this found the right way to water them yet. Uh, but they, I think my gut says they, they probably just need a little more water than we get out here, but they really, they, they want to be protected. Uh, you can't, you can't, you couldn't go park this, uh, like plant this out in the park strip, for instance. It just, it wouldn't like it out there, but a shady spot out of the wind, uh, where it'll get just a little bit of light sun probably would work. So it's a, it's a, it's a little tricky of a plant. Uh, we just had a question come in about, um, if you can find evergreen shrubs on our plant finder. Uh, we currently do not have evergreen shrubs as a search option, but we are working on expanding that. Um, and we will take that into consideration and make that something that is searchable. Um, so thank you I for just saw, I just saw a question pop up about weed fabric. Don't use weed fabric. I hate weed fabric. Okay, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, 
let's see. Can you recommend evergreens for foundation plantings? Um, so I, I'm not a designer, uh, but I don't see why not. There are lots of evergreens that would be in that right range uh, for a foundation planting. Um, and actually being uh, evergreens and you know with that year round uh, uh, look, it would be it would be a year round uh, planting. So yeah, my my thought would be yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, going along with that, I'm going to plug our database one more time. Yep. If you go on our website on the plant finder, um, you can search for evergreen plants and in the local scape design elements, there is a section, um, one of those called foundation plantings, and that should help narrow your search as well. Uh, let's see, things keep popping up. What is the issue for plants with secondary water? Uh, so the biggest, the biggest problem we get with secondary water um, is it tends to be heavy in salts uh, and various salts and, and that tends to burn plants out. Uh, I know, I know there's a lot of things that just that don't like it, although I, I can particularly point to a lot of, uh, a lot of the evergreens, uh, spruces in particular just seem to hate the, the secondary water uh, it's but it mainly mainly the problem is with the salts uh, in there which is like it can be high in, in like nitrogen and phosphorus and these types of salts that tend to that tend to be too high and uh, since it's already uh, in the water and, and uh, dissolved it takes them up really fast and as it kind of goes up through the system they kind of burns the needles and stuff out they they really don't like uh, the secondary water is great so 